In this lecture, my goal is to cover about 3,000 years of Indian history in a relatively short period of time. So it's going to be very general and it's going to cover very broad periods very, very quickly. And just do your best to keep up and watch twice if you have to. First off, the land that we're talking about here is sometimes called the Indian subcontinent, sometimes called Southern Asia. Uh, the reason it's called the subcontinent is many gajillions of years ago, it used to be its own continent uh, floating along in the ocean. And then it, you know, sort of swam up north and smashed into Asia. And that's what caused the Himalayan mountains. So the southern Asia, India is the land south of the Himalayan mountains that were caused by the two continents smashing together. And because of those mountains, it, it's been a little bit separated from from Asia and has a very you know distinct culture and distinct history that we'll discuss now. Civilization begins in Southern Asia much the same way it began in Mesopotamia. It happens around the same time. Instead of being based around the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, the city-states in Southern Asia end up arising around the Indus River Valley. And so we call this early the earliest Indian civilization, the Indus River Civilization. And they get city-states, start showing up around the Indus River Valley. The two most famous are Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro. And these, again, are city-states much like Mesopotamia, but a little more mysterious. And the reason that they're more mysterious is that we cannot read their writing. We know they had writing. You know, we've discovered a number of artifacts in these ancient cities that have writing on it, but we haven't been able to decipher it. So our knowledge about their culture and exactly how they worked is imperfect. What we know is they must have had some sort of organized government because they have, you know, running water, they've got ditches, they've got like, these organized cities that could only have been, uh, could only have existed if they had some sort of functioning government. Again, a, a civilization, but our knowledge about them is somewhat limited. What we know is they're around around 3000 BC, they're coming up, they're around for about 1500 years, and then around 1500 they start to go away. That doesn't mean all the people die, it doesn't mean those people go away, it just means that the cities uh, aren't used as much. Uh, there might have been some natural disasters, might have been some you know wars, political infighting, but uh, this, there's a very distinct civilization that is around in Southern Asia called the Indus River Valley Civilization, and that goes from around 3000 to around 1500 and then goes away. Then around 1500 BC, the Aryans arrive in Southern Asia. And the Aryans is just our word for these nomadic people that came from Central Asia. Uh, they came down into Southern Asia and they brought with them uh, a couple of distinct cultural elements uh, that we know then became, you know, infused with everyone who was already living in India. And those were, importantly, Sanskrit, which is a language that we can read. So now we can start, you know, reading the literature and the things that are going on in the country. So now we can start understanding a lot more of the history and their own sort of political way of doing things, their own social structures. One of those is uh, the, having a, a king uh, called a Raja over a certain area. Uh, the Aryans come in, they're not sort of this unified political thing. They're like a people that, you know, have cultural traits. They come in, they invade, and India ends up being sort of divided into about 16 kingdoms or, you know, 16 areas ruled by Rajas for a while. Another very important thing that the Aryans bring with them uh, are, is the caste system. Again, this is their social structure. Their society is divided between the, you know, the well-off and the not-so-well-off. There's nothing extraordinary about that. What, what was interesting about the Indian caste system is how rigid it was. You had uh, priests at the top, and then you had warriors, and then landowners, peasants, farmers, uh, all the way down. And the caste system, again, was very strict. You could only marry someone in your own 
caste and you had to do whatever your whatever caste you were born into you had to be that you know you sort of had to follow in the family business that was required so you couldn't marry outside your caste you couldn't you know take an occupation or whatever outside your caste it was very rigid whatever you were born into that's that's what you had to do and again this was a sort of a system the Aryans had that they then bring in Along with their language and their social structures, the Aryans also bring their religion, uh, Hinduism, uh, still the majority religion in India today. Again, I'm speaking very broadly here, but in short, uh, Hinduism is a religion that believes in many gods. There's a belief in reincarnation or uh, uh, souls being born again after they die, coming back to the world and also very importantly a belief in karma a belief that the your good deeds or your bad deeds you know sort of come back to affect you uh, significantly in terms of you know reincarnation of the your karma you, you know the good or bad deeds that you do will affect you know what caste say you're born into in your next life it's tough to say how old Hinduism is. Uh, the Aryans seem to be the ones to bring it to Southern Asia, but again, the sort of the oldest records that we've got from them seems to have them, you know, already practicing it. So it's one of those religions that goes so far back, it's sort of difficult, impossible to, to say, you know, what the age of it is. That is not the case for Buddhism. Buddhism comes from India. Uh, the Buddha was a, a historical figure named Siddhartha and he was a man who was born into wealth and privilege who then you know gave up all of his money to pursue philosophy and the the ideas he came up with became the basis for Buddhism. Again very much in brief a sort of summary of those beliefs uh, come down to what he himself called the Four Noble Truths and those were that um, all life is suffering, to live is to suffer, and that suffering is caused by desire, you know, desire for the things of this world, wanting to have an Xbox, wanting to have a pair of shoes, and that the way to end suffering was to end your, your desire, or mostly, your, you know, your desire for the things of this world, for selfish goals, that you needed to end your desire for those things, and then you'd be able to reach nirvana, or you'd be able to, you know, reach the ultimate goal, peace. And the way to do that was to follow the Eightfold Path. That was the fourth truth. The Eightfold Path, in a nutshell, you don't have to know every single one, is just to lead a moderate life, you know, be very mindful, be respectful, uh, you know, be, be moderate and good. So that was his, you know, prescription. That was his philosophy. In a nutshell, he had a lot more to say about a lot of things. He lived around the like the late 500s, early 400s, and his the religion really starts you know taking off after his death and, and spreading. So to summarize, the first Indian civilizations are small city states, just like the ones in Mesopotamia. Then there's a significant change uh, with the arrival of again the people we call the. Aryans, they bring in a number of cultural changes, including the caste system and Hinduism. Then you add to that mix Buddhism, which arrives in like the 500s, and you have the sort of basis for the background of, of what India is all about in the chapters that we'll study in the future.